Recently I did a video about the Melvins album Prick and I talked about a technique called Music Concrete which I applied to some of the techniques of recording in there unbeknownst to my band members and so I'd like to talk a little bit further about Music Concrete and a piece that I made in 2006 called Iraq. So Iraq is a purely music concrete piece and music concrete is defined as a form of composition using found materials, found audio materials, not unlike what Marcel Duchamp did with a urinal or what Robert Rauschenberg did in the 1960s as a expression of abstract expressionism. Now music concrete dates back to the 1940s and in particular a Frenchman called Pierre Schaeffer who started experimenting with found audio materials and creating works out of them. At the same time, there was an Egyptian composer and his name was Halim El Dab, and he started experimenting around the same time doing the same thing. So this is sort of like the two guys who started experimenting with algebra in the 18th century at the same time unbeknownst to each other. So what I did with this was I used instances of George W. Bush saying the word Iraq and created an entire piece out of those. So I've got the program notes here that came within the CD and I'd like to read them to just give you an idea of what was going on in this piece. I'd like to thank all of my subscribers and especially my Patreon supporters and remind you that you can buy me a coffee in the link below. So thanks for watching. I appreciate you. So I'm going to read the program notes for Iraq. This piece is generated entirely from a single loop of seven instances of George W. Bush saying the word Iraq. Two are from the announcement from the beginning of Operation Iraqi Freedom and three are from the Mission Accomplished speech, both from 2003. Two are from a State of the Union address in January 2006. Repetition of a word is the surest path towards rendering it obsolete. At its technological limit, there are 14,112,000 repetitions per minute of this word in this piece. Modern media ensures that the destiny of anesthesia is the logical outcome for perpetual repetition of a word. When taken to a possible extreme, there is a transcendence of this inherent redundancy, a subconscious revelation of intrinsic veracity through absolute negation, MD 2006. So that's what I was thinking about after hearing the word Iraq said, one billion times over and over in the media, much like we're hearing other words said over and over, like Ukraine or Israel or Gaza. It's like these words just get said endlessly, and the result is they have a numbing effect. So anyway, that's how this piece, Iraq, came about. And it's quite the listen. Um, to those of you who have it, you know what I'm talking about. To anybody else, it's not actually online but there may be a few copies floating around out there of it, as it was a limited edition. So here's a small sample of the piece and what it sounds like. Hmm. Sounds like music concrete to me. Good job, Mark. So here's a little bit of the history of Iraq, in case the only thing you ever knew about it was that it was basically bombed into oblivion by the United States almost a couple of times. Let's say one and a half times. So Iraq is a super interesting country. It was originally part of Mesopotamia, which was considered the cradle of civilization. And the early civilization that was there was the Sumerians in the fourth millennium BC. So this is thousands of years ago. And the Sumerians were quite an incredible people. They 
contributed various forms of early writing to civilization, as well as being one of the earliest civilizations to embrace the wheel and start to use that. During the Islamic Golden Age, the city of Baghdad was a Mecca for all types of intellectuals who were traveling throughout the world at the time. So it was really considered an extremely valuable part of civilization at the time. In the 1920s is when Iraq became Iraq, the original country that we know today on some level and proceeded to be taken advantage of by the British Petroleum Company and a variety of other people. Fast forward to 1991 and we have Iraq being messed with by the United States by Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld. And so that didn't work out too well as Iraq got kind of tricked into using a giant straw to steal Kuwait's oil, which the United States used in turn to get Iraq and Iran to go to war with each other, which went on for a while. The United States funded both sides in this conflict that went on for five years. Hundreds of thousands of people died. It was extremely unfortunate. And then, of course, there was the whole weapons of mass destruction thing, which happened in 2003 where a whole bunch of other Iraqis died. And in between the 1991 war and the 2003 war, there was this period of hideous sanctions placed on Iraq, medicine, all kinds of stuff. And one of the most famous quotes to come out of that was from none other than Madeleine Albright, the first female Secretary of State for the United States. And when asked, what she thought of half a million Iraqi children dying because of medicine sanctions, she said, well, I think it was worth it. So we have that. And so when the second Iraq war started, I was actually in El Paso, Texas. So the war was starting up and I wrote a poem called Life During Wartime. I had lived in the UK all through the 90s and the very late 80s and moved back to the United States in 2001, just in time for 9-11. And so on 9-11, I was in El Paso, Texas. I remember watching it on the television in the morning and being flabbergasted as to what I was seeing. One of the initial responses by the US government on that day was to seal the borders. And so being in El Paso, Texas, it has an extremely fluid border that is dependent on commerce and family members living on both sides of the border. It's an extremely fluid situation and they sealed the border there. And what that did was instantly create a 20 mile long traffic jam on I-10, which runs through El Paso to Tucson. And they did that for about four or five hours and created absolute chaos. And then they had to open the border because of the traffic jam. So there is no such thing as sealing a border, despite what any politician says now. It's just not happening, at least not in El Paso on 9-11 or probably any other day. So a couple of years later, when the Iraq war started, I was still living there and I was just taking in everything that was happening on the ramp up to war, all the weapons of mass destruction nonsense, which of course history has revealed to be utterly false. And so I was thinking about that. I was writing a lot of poetry at the time. And I wrote a poem called Life During Wartime, which was my experience during war in El Paso, Texas in 2003, which I would like to read for you now. Incidentally, this is the first time I've ever read one of my poems in public anywhere. Well, I did go to a couple of poetry jams. Poetry. I did some poetry jams. Is that what they call them? Um, what do they call them? Slams? Well, jams? They call them hams. Poetry hams. That's what they call them. But I've never read this one anywhere. So... This is a world premiere. Life during wartime. I woke with a headache after the man I fought in my dream put his own eyes out to show his fearlessness. There was an elaborate plan to electrocute me and large women in plastic begged for wounds. Gossamer clad 
petite Aphrodite's tenaciously competed for my attention in a ruined castle, distracting my efforts to escape. Getting up cold from sweat, I stared out at the empty Texas blue, contemplating rich, delicious coffee and pasta with seafood, saffron, and garlic later in the day. There was one glass of wine left in the bottle. I would have to get more. The garage needed cleaning out. I figured I'd do it later. The only sound came from the dripping kitchen tap and the hammering from the roof next door. Later, when I walked across the bridge to Juarez, a mother and a child snuck around the back of a federale and continued begging further up the bridge. I picked up some smokes, ate lunch, and walked back. There were almost no cars on the bridge, and a fresh spring breeze came off the mountains. I showed the card to the man and thought that it was tougher to get into a bar than it was to get into the USA. I checked the mail and held in my hand something addressed to the household shopper, a leaflet with pictures of three missing children, and the electric bill. The radio was saying it was a beautiful day with a high of 77, but that it would be windy tomorrow. I went to the pool hall and started playing nine ball. On the televisions were Ultimate Fighting, The Man Show, Women's Basketball, and The War. A CD machine played a song with the line, Bitches, they come, they go. Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday, yo. Fat guys ate fried cheese sticks. Fat guys ate fried cheese sticks, drank light beer, raced virtual snowmobiles on a video screen. In between the war to control the second largest oil supply in the world, Wendy's had burgers for 99 cents, Viagra had a 40-something couple smiling. Intrepid actors were going to the Earth's core. Trucks were built Ford tough. And the gluttonous Hummer could take me anywhere I wanted to go once I was serious enough. I worked on my pool game, checked out the women with the two fat guys. I finished up, put the cue away, and walked outside. All the stars were out and twinkling, oblivious perhaps even non-existent, as their light finally reached me. It was colder than the night before, so I rolled down my sleeves and walked home. And that's it. That's my experience of life during wartime in El Paso, Texas in 2003. Hope you enjoyed it. And of course, I could write another sequel called Life During Wartime, and it would be pretty much the same as now. No bombs falling, nothing happening. I don't have a dripping kitchen tap, so that means things are in order. <laughs>